for the healing, for the signs and the wonders that we speak forth out of our mouth, that out of our mouths will come forth that healing to a soul. Out of our mouth will come the sign that Jesus is here, that the Father has sent Jesus. We thank you for the wonders of the supernatural power of God, that we can deliver it through our mouths, that we can send it airmail, that we can send it out as packages from our mouth, deliver it to somebody's house that may be 20 miles, 40 miles, 100, 500 miles. We deliver the package of healing right now to Jesus. From Jesus' heart to yours. Healing signs and wonders. There'll be healing signs and wonders. There'll be many asking for the healing signs and wonders. Who is that man? <laughs> Who is that man, Jesus? Who has healing signs? Who's giving you the authority to carry healing signs and wonders? Because of Jesus. glorify your name we thank you Jesus we bless you Jesus hallelujah this is the glass this is the ground that we stand this is the ground that we stand on this is the place that we live out of this is the place of praise this is a place of thanksgiving this is a place of lifting up Jesus this is a place where we can be free Hallelujah, that we can go to deeper depths, that we can understand the deep things of God, that we can understand the height, the breadth, and the depth of who he is, that we become one. We thank you right now that the full measure of Christ is coming together. We thank you that the full measure of Christ is coming together as a people who are all on one accord. Give God praise, shouting his glory, shouting his praise, giving him utmost praise. Adoration. We thank you, Jesus. Come together in us. Come together in us. Coming together in us. Hey. We're in another place in him. Hey. We're, we're in another place in him. Yes, Lord, we're in another place. We're in another place. Another realm of glory. We're in another place in Him. In another place in Jesus. In another place in Jesus. We're in another place in Him. We're in another place. Yes, Lord, this is a new realm of possibility. This is a new realm. 
that truths unlock the doors, giving us access. Hallelujah, that truth and worship giving us access to what seems to be impossible, what seems to be uh, uh, marked as far away is now coming close. Hallelujah. Things that were far off are now beginning to be here right now, manifesting in moments like this. Things that were far off that could not be fathomed are being manifested right here, right now, in this place, in this place where we're giving ourselves, in this place. Oh, say, in this place, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit's in this place, Holy Spirit's in this place, fan yourself around, spread yourself around, Holy Spirit's in this place, Holy Spirit's in this place, Holy Spirit's in this place. Yes, Spread yourself around. Eh. Spread yourself around. Eh. Yeah. Yeah. Holy Spirit stirring this place. Holy Spirit stirring this place. Holy Spirit stirring this place. Eh. Holy Spirit stirring this place. 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 Holy Spirit stirring Holy Spirit stirring this place. Holy Holy Spirit stirring Holy, Holy Spirit stirring this place. Yeah. Holy Spirit stirring this place. That's what you're doing. Holy yeah. Spirit stirring yeah. this place. That's what you're doing. Holy Spirit yeah. stirring this place. Holy Every heart. Holy Spirit stirring this place. It's in your power. Holy Spirit yeah. stirring. And you're stirring, Holy Spirit stirring, this stirring up the souls of men, stirring, this stirring up the heart. Holy Spirit you're stirring, this you're place. stirring up the heart. Holy Spirit stirring, Holy Spirit stirring, it's providing to us. The stirring of the heart. The stirring we awaken in the heart. It's stirring, it's stirring. 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 It's stirring up the truth. Holy Spirit is stirring this place. It's stirring up the truth. Holy Spirit is stirring this place. It's holding up the truth. Holy Spirit is stirring this place. Setting our affections. Holy Spirit is stirring this place. On your truth today. Holy Spirit is stirring this place. Setting my heart on it. Holy Spirit is stirring this place. Setting my life on it. Holy Spirit is stirring this place. It's your truth. Holy Spirit is stirring this place. It's your truth. Holy Spirit is stirring this place. Penetrating my heart. Holy Spirit is stirring this place. Penetrating my Holy mind. Holy Spirit is stirring this place. Helping me to believe. Holy Spirit is stirring this place. Giving me the power Holy to believe. Giving me authority Holy to believe. Spirit is stirring this place. Giving me a right Holy mind to believe. Spirit is stirring this place. Giving me the power Holy to believe. Hey. Giving me the power Holy to have faith. Hey. To hold up my loins in truth. Hey. Hey. To hold up my loins in truth. I will girdle myself Holy in it. Hey. I will wrap myself Holy in it. I will wrap myself Holy in it. Hey. Spirit stirring this place. Hey, uh, something's about 
about to break out impossible. Something's about to break out that's impossible. Something's about to happen that's impossible. But God is stirring this place. God is stirring this place. He's showing himself mighty. Showing himself to be holy. Because he is a man of his word. No, the son of man that he shall repent. Oh, no, he will never lie. But something supernatural is happening. Something's happening right now that I could never have changed myself. That I could never have fixed myself. But because your Holy Spirit is stirring, and I decided to get in your stirring, I decided to jump into your truth. Hey, I decided to add in my faith. Hey, I decided to make sure the ingredients were right. That when you begin to stir, true holiness comes out of there. The power of the Holy Spirit will go there. Ah, supernatural things will go there. Will come out of the stirring of God. Come out in the stirring of God. Come out in the stirring of God. Holy Spirit stirring this place. Something supernatural is happening. Hey, we're not believing on a lesser level than supernatural. Something supernatural is happening right now. We're living in some rare air and rare space right now. Right now. Supernatural power of the Lord is moving right now. Jesus. 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 Stir Jesus. Stir it up, Jesus. Stir it up, Jesus. Stir it up, Jesus. Stir it in our hearts today. Stir it up, Jesus. Stir it in our minds today. Settle it in our hearts today. Stir it up, Jesus. Stir it up, Jesus. Stir it up, Jesus. Oh, it's the truth. Stir it up, Jesus. It's the mix that we need. <laughs> it's the food that we need. It's the drink that we need. It is Jesus. It's the food that we need. It's the table we need to sit at. It's the place where we can stay. The place that we live at, there's a stirring, there's a stirring for truth, there's a stirring, I'm speaking to you, there's a stirring, there's a stirring for truth, for truth, there's a stirring, there's a stirring, to want truth only, there's a stirring, there's a stirring, to want only Jesus, there is a stirring. A stirring. To want only what he says, there's a stirring. There's a stirring. There's a stirring for peace. There's a stirring. That surpasses our understanding. There's a stirring. There's a stirring. For real joy. There's a stirring. There's a stirring. To contend for the faith. There's a stirring. There's a, stirring. There's a truth stirring. There's a stirring. There's revelation that's stirring. There's, stirring. There's supernatural that's stirring. Because what we receive is great. There's a stirring. I decree that every truth that we have will stick. <laughs> There's a truth that we have that's going to stick in a state. Because of the stirring of the Holy Spirit. There's a stirring in our heart for only truth. 
There's a stirring in our heart for only Jesus. There's a stirring for our heart just for him. Nothing else, just him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There's a stirring for just Jesus. Hallelujah. There's a stirring for only Jesus. For only Jesus in our lives. When I wake up, only Jesus. When I get up by my day, only Jesus. There's a stirring. There's a stirring. There's a stirring. There's a stirring of the inner man. There's a stirring, a quickening happening in our hearts for true, hallelujah, to be exposed in our hearts today. There's stirring for truth to be lived out, out of us. We're going to live out our truths today. We're going to live out our, our, our real identity today. There's a true stirring of the Lord right now. By the presence of the Holy Spirit, I pronounce it now. We're going to live out every measure of your identity every day. Because there is a stirring of the Holy Spirit. There's an unction from heaven. There's an unction from the Father. That he wants to gather up his people. That he wants his people to walk in true wisdom true authority and true likeness God's heart is stirring up for his people God wants us to live in truth God is removing every false identity out of your life and he's replacing it with the truth of his love he's replacing it with the truth of what he did for us What didn't make sense is going to make sense now. When you heard it, it didn't make sense, but it's going to make sense now. Because God's heart for you is making sense of everything. He's drawing the lines together, line upon line. Precept upon precept, we will understand. With that understanding, we will live out. Everything he spoke about us, there's a sturdy of the spirit of the Lord. There's a stirring. There's a stirring. There's a stirring. There's a stirring. It's happening right now. There's a stirring. It's happening right now. There's a stirring. It's happening right now. There's a stirring. There's a stirring in us. There's a stirring. There's a stirring in us. There's a stirring. What's happening to us, we're not going to be able to contain it. We're not going to be able to contain it. We're going to get home and wonder why we're still weeping. We're going to get in our cars and wonder why I'm still praising. <laughs> we're going to lay down to go to sleep and two hours later we're still up glorifying the Lord and blessing his name because the Father's heart is on you. His truth is resonating who you are today. going to wonder even as you fall asleep and wake up why are you speaking in tongues soon as you get up in the morning hallelujah soon as you open up your eyes Jesus I thank you that the first thought on your mind will be Jesus only Jesus only Jesus we got enough other stuff only Jesus man stirring there's a stirring for Jesus there's a stirring for truth 
There's a stirring for the liberation of what truth is. Truth gonna liberate you this day. It's gonna liberate your lifestyle. Hey, it's gonna liberate the way that you've been living. It's gonna liberate everything. Everything. God does everything. It's a stirring. Oh. It's a stirring. Removing all the obstacles now. There's a stirring. Removing all the hangups right now. There's a stirring. After today, you'll never be the same. Because the word will manifest itself. The word will manifest itself in your life. You'll never be the same. <laughs> Truth is going to manifest itself in ways that it hasn't manifested itself up until this point. It's going to overtake us and we will not be able to contain it. We will not be able to hold it. There is a stirring of the truth of Jesus. Stir something up. <laughs> I dare you to agree with the Spirit of God and begin to stir your mouth right now. There's a realization that's going to happen when you begin to stir up your mouth and your heart right now. <laughs> Don't believe it. Open your mouth. <laughs> Don't believe it. Raise your hand. Don't believe it. Open your ears to hear and watch God. Watch God. Watch God. Watch God. you can always transfer your funds through cash app to dollar sign GRRC flow FLO Stirring. 
back in Darlington, Apostle Mary used to make us everybody walk up and touch the basket, whether you had an opportunity to give or not. Children touch the basket. Adults that's not given tonight touch the basket. Uh, Minister McCoy is uh, prophesying that there's a stirring and that God is doing some supernatural, something impossible, but it's possible because it's God. So I wouldn't miss out on this if I were y'all. Everybody could come up and bring an offering and also come up and just tap the basket. All the children, all the adults. By the direction of Sister Marlene. work of our hands, Lord God. And Lord, we just thank you that the money that we gave today, Lord God, is continuing to be used throughout the kingdom, Lord God, to continue to build your kingdom and reach those, Lord God, that you want to be reached. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to head right into the announcements. There's just a couple. So you guys know that we are currently renovating the new building that God has blessed us with for GRC Florence. Thank you, Lord. Yes, he deserves all the glory. He's always doing something supernatural. Like, if y'all don't realize, I think this is probably the third time that we've had a building kind of just come to us. I don't know if you all know the story or not, but of course it was some supernatural. Um, so, if you are a skilled painter, skilled painter, you your help is needed. This Saturday, May 23rd at 8 o'clock, we're going to be at the New Florence location. That's 817 South Cashua Drive here in Florence. Um, and if you have any questions, you can contact Sister Faith, Sister Veronica Law, or uh, Sister Samantha Scott. So again, just come out Saturday, 8 a.m. They're going to be painting the new, the new location. Amen. And then we haven't been in here for a while, so I just want to remind you guys of the um, general housekeeping rules that we had the last time we were here. Um, of course, we asked no gum chewing. Children should not have any open writing utensils, anything that bleeds like pens or markers we ask that you, and crayons. We ask that you don't even have that in the sanctuary. Um, no children back at the coffee station, please. <laughs> and then also please clean your row or area before you leave the church because it kind of helps people who sticks around to actually clean up. It, you know, it decreases the amount of work that they have to do. And also, please try to limit as much as possible traffic going back and forth um, to go to the bathroom during the word. But that would be it. So we're going to go ahead and welcome Apostle Mary. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Wow. Hey, man, you, look, you may be seated. This is, this is a little bit different than the last time we were here, I see. We got some different lightings and, and fixtures and, and all those good things. Amen. But, but I will say this much about it. I would say um, that 
Look, I'm glad to be back in Florence. I'll say that much. I don't know about nobody else. I, I think I got spoiled a little bit. And therefore, um, when we had to drive that extra 30 minutes after preaching, man, I was, I was calling my wife on the way home every time. Saying, man, I'm tired of driving these 30 minutes. I'm, so, you know, so I am um, I'm really, really, really just thankful. Um, that, that God is doing what he's doing and he set in motion. You have, to, you have to turn that fan. What he set in motion and accomplishing what he desires to accomplish. I believe that heavens are opening over um, Darlington. I believe that there's an assignment there that as we gather on Sunday and we'll continue to do that until the Lord kind of brings us to a conclusion uh, and he kind of accomplishes all that that he desires to accomplish, but I, there, I would indeed have to agree in anybody who has a, any measure of sensitivity to the spirit, that this is indeed a stirring. We're in the midst of God is stirring some stuff on the inside of us that, that we're so very, very thankful for. Um, and I want to go ahead and, and jump into what I'm going to share tonight with you all. It's a continuation of what I started on Sunday which I actually dealt with on Thursday because I believe that there is importance in understanding Glorious Remnant Revival Community. What makes us glorious and what makes us that glorious community is the fact that we're a presence-centered community. Um, we're a community that understands the show don't start until we know the presence is sufficiently manifest amongst us. And so it's a blessing to have a praise team and musicians that are sensitive to the presence of God in a sense to know that we, we're going to stay here and allow the, the presence of God that's here to begin to manifest, and then we can move on. But, but there's no need to go on with the program until we understand that the presence of God is sufficiently here. We're a presence-centered community. Amen. We're a presence-centered culture that everything we do, we do life out of the presence of God. Amen. Um, we're, we're a Davidic expression. We're a Davidic expression of ministry. Um, we understand that the Davidic expression of leadership and the Davidic expression of community uh, 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 resets um, people's purpose into pursuing God. Um, that David was raised up and his focal point was to ensure that he went after the ark, which we understand um, symbolizes the presence of God, the mobile, the presence of God that moves with us. That it's not, it moves beyond entering the presence of God into now taking the presence of God where we go. Amen. Um, it's moving with the presence. Not only that, on an individual basis, it means moving with the presence, but on a corporate basis, it means the fixed in place presence of God, that when we come, he's always here. Um, um, understanding that is so, so very important because I believe that God is now set us in motion to recover the ark, to recover a dimension of his presence for which people know when they come in our midst that God's manifest presence is here. Amen. That God's manifest presence is here amongst us. And that when we leave and go to work, we know that God's presence is amongst us. His presence is present on us. Where we are, he's present. His presence becomes present upon us. His presence is not what, where he wants it to be until his presence is present upon us. The day of Pentecost was about his presence being present upon 120 people. And you shall be endued with power from on high when the spirit of God shall come upon you. His presence being present upon his people. We're a presence-centered community. Amen. And we must understand that the presence isn't where, it where the presence wants to be until it's upon you and me. When we leave, when we go, when we come, when we in the valley or when we're up upon the mountain, when we're at work or we're at home, that is the, the now ultimate desire when we talk about retrieving the ark. 
Amen. That we must understand. So I'm going to go back to First Chronicles. One of the books of history. First Chronicles chapter 15. Verse number one. Thank you, Lord. God is shifting us out of a Saul-led leadership style into a Davidic expression. Saul was king for 42 years, according to the Hebrew scripture. According to historians, he was king half that time, 20-some years. Either way, he never spent one day going after the ark of God, which was the symbolization of his presence. Presence was not priority in his leadership, although he was leading God's people. Saul represents leaders that don't mind having church without the Holy Spirit. Saul represents leaderships, leadership that, that, that now uh, turns to entertainment. And as long as people have a good time, uh, don't miss the glory. Amen. The aim isn't the glory. The aim is good time. The aim isn't edification. The aim is entertainment. Amen. Bec uh, the aim is getting the best musicians, the best sounding singers, because... I have to find a way to keep the people's attention. Amen. Versus David now in Davidic expression who says that it's about the presence. We got to go back after the presence of God. Um, and so I'm going to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 15. And I'm going to read verse number 1. And this is after David. And we talked about this. King David had went after the ark the first time in his initial attempt to get the ark. To re recover the ark, the presence of God, um, the oxen stumbled. Uzzah put out his hand, amen, and God struck him dead on the spot, and the ark ended up in Obed-Edom's house, amen. This is now his second attempt. This is the, the, the now story behind that. Verse number 1 says, And David made him houses in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched for it a tent. That's a very, very key verse. Um, uh, verse number two, then David said, none ought to carry the ark of God, but the Levites for them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. And David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord unto his place, which he had prepared for it. Is that what your Bible says? First Chronicles chapter six, 6, 16, excuse me. We'll go over one chapter. And this is now after they bring the ark. They, they successfully get the ark back to Israel. Verse, um, chapter 16, verse number one. So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it. And they offered burnt sacrifices and peace offerings before God. And when David had made an end of offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. And he dealt to every one of Israel, both man and woman, to every one a loaf of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. Now, this is the key part. Verse number four. And he appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord and to record and to thank and to praise the Lord God of Israel. That had never been done before. Amen. Um, um, they have Asaph, the chief, and next to him, Zechariah, Jael, and Shimaroth, and Jehiel, and Matiah, and Eliab, and Benani, and Obed-Edom, and Jael, with psalteries and with harps, but Asaph made a sound with cymbals. Benani and Jehaziel, the priests, with trumpets continually before the ark of the covenant of God. This is David now. When we you hear people talk about the tabernacle of David and um, talk about 24-hour worship and 24-hour prayer, it comes from this text. David was the one who inaugurated men to worship before the ark of God all day, every day. He actually assigned men to praise and to worship, to sing and to dance before God's presence. Amen. Moment by moment in shifts throughout the day. So you had a different shift come in to come and sing and dance and praise. And then another shift would come in all day. 
Amen. And all night. Now, um, if you go to verse 36 of John 16, and then we'll, we'll jump into it. It says, um, let me read something else. Blessed be the Lord, um, God of Israel forever and ever. And all the people said, amen, and praise the Lord. Verse 37, so he left there before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, Asaph and his brethren, to minister before the ark continually as every day's work required. And Obed-Edom with their brethren, three score and eight, 68 of them. Obed-Edom, also the son of Jaduth, Jaduthan and Hose to be, Hosa to be porters. Right, we're going to stop right there. Father, we just thank you. And we bless you right now that you would speak to us. And Lord God, that you would align us and that you would instruct us and, and posture us for that, Lord God, what you're doing in this season and time. And we'll bless you and thank you and give you the glory, the honor, and the praises in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to go back to First Chronicles 15, verse number 1, and we'll jump right into what it is the Lord is saying. Verse number 1 in First Chronicles 15 says, And David made him houses, listen closely, in the city of David, and prepared a place. Everybody say prepared a place. And prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched it a tent. David prepared a place. Watch this. He prepared a place for the ark before he actually went to retrieve the ark. He, I'm going to say that again. The first time he went, the second time he prepared a place, then he went. David prepared a place for the ark before he actually went to retrieve the ark. So what we need to understand is, is that King David did not simply go that by implication to experience the ark. He did not go to encounter the ark. David went with the expectation to leave with the ark. He prepared a place in his home before he went to where the ark was. And this is review, but we need to make sure we go back here. Going after presence, going after the presence of God is going after that which we plan not to simply encounter nor to experience, but more so to bring back with us. It's something that we take home, and, and, and we hit that on Sunday. Now, uh, to take that thought a step further, in a sense, we are to always approach the presence of God with the best way I could describe it is a to-go box. We are to come into the presence of God with a to-go box because his presence never wants to stay where we met it. His presence wants to go with us when we leave the encounter for which his presence was experienced. We as a people, we as a church will never sufficiently benefit from the presence of God until we understand that we are to always approach his presence with a to-go box. Now, now, why do we take the to-go boxes into facilities? Because we plan to eat when we get there, but we know there's going to be more available than we could eat while we're sitting there. So we take a to-go box because we realize what's available is bigger than what I can handle at the moment. And God is saying now, when we come to church, we have to approach the presence the same way. We have to approach the presence understanding what happens to me in, in the presence of God at church is bigger than I can intake in the two and a half to three hours I'm in church. I must come with a plan to box up what happened so I can take it home because anybody knows when you take that box home, it's good reheated. There's some stuff that happened in the house that I got to reheat. There's some stuff that broke out that I got I to gotta reheat it. I got to turn it back on. I got to touch it again. I got to make sure I experience it. And so what we must understand is we are to always come to church. We are to come in the gathering where we understand he's in the midst, understanding there's something that I'm taking home with me after I exit out of the environment I encountered the presence of God. 
First Chronicles 15 and 1 says it this way again. And David prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched for it a tent. If we're going to recover the mobile presence of God individually, where we take home with us individually, what we came to uh, together and experience corporately, it demands pitching a tent for the to-go presence. We must pitch a tent. The Bible says that David pitched a tent, a man at home before he went to Kerjath, Kerjath, Jerim to retrieve the ark. So many times, now please hear me because we're talking about recovering the presence. So many times the presence we encounter corporately isn't available for us to take home individually, although it's supposed to be because we didn't prepare a place for him before we left home. Please follow me. In other words, what am I saying when I say we got to pitch a tent and prepare a place in other words we didn't come to church prepared to rearrange our lives if necessary for the sake of the presence we were about to encounter it we got to leave home saying if i got to change home whatever happens at church whatever happens whatever is revealed to me i am prepared to alter what happens and how i run my house for the sake of bringing home whatever it is i encounter what i get in that corporate setting the presence we encounter is not available to go unless we've made space come on we prepared a place for it at home or we pitched a tent that means we must come to church with the mentality father if you move Father, if you move, I'll rearrange my life to accommodate that move. I'll, I will turn stuff upside down to, to now accommodate that move. If you speak, I'll renovate my mind to make accommodations to steward your voice in my life. I will take a hammer to the floors of my mind. I will, I'll repaint walls. I'll tear up stuff to renovate for the sake of stewarding the voice that I heard when I encountered your presence when we came together. What we got to understand is if there, there must be a place prepared before we get here. The Bible says he prepared a place for the ark before he ever went to encounter the ark. I'm talking about recovering the presence of God. The tabernacle of David is the prophetic picture of a, watch this, prophetic picture of a necessary posture. I'm going to say that again. The tabernacle of David is a prophetic picture of a necessary posture we must embrace in order to take the presence home. And David prepared a place for the ark of God and pitch for it a tent. We can't enter into corporate glory with a to-go box until there's a place prepared for the presence of God in our personal life. Amen. We must have already made up in our mind. If something breaks out in this house, the way that I left my house, I'm willing to rearrange the way I run my house. I'm willing to rearrange the way I do my free time. I'm willing to turn some stuff upside down to prepare a place for the presence that I'm encountering. I believe this. I believe that there was a reason now, this is me personally, that David failed in bringing the ark home initially besides the fact that he did not instruct the Levites to carry it on their shoulders. I believe that there's another reason also hidden within that text and embedded in that text for which the reason why David could not bring back the presence of God to the city of David. I believe he could not bring that that ark back which uh, represented the, the glory because he hadn't sufficiently prepared a place for it. I don't I, the, see if you read the text um, closely you'll notice the first time he said let us go after it he hadn't prepared a place for it yet. The second time in first is, is first Chronicles 15, and it starts out, and David made a house in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark. 
Amen. And so that's why I believe the oxen stumbled. I believe the oxen stumbled and Uzzah put his hands on what he should have never placed his hands on simply because David had not sufficiently prepared a place to bring what he said he was going after. And so what we got to understand is when we don't sufficiently prepare a place in our personal lives for the glory and we attempt to bring his presence back home into our personal lives, we wind up stumbling. We, glory be to God. I'm going I'm to I'm I'm share that a little bit, and I just want to go in that train of thought. There's stuff that begins to break out in our corporate setting that we attempt to take back into our personal lives that we wind up stumbling and therefore losing before it ever gets there. We, we try to bring home measures of freedom, measures of freedom that now broke out, watch this, while the word was going forth and the presence of God pulsated in the atmosphere we felt the freedom and we said man I'm taking that home but I'm taking that freedom back home but the problem is we came to church and never prepared a place for the freedom we said we're taking home so somewhere along the line we stumble and therefore lose the freedom that we got in the corporate setting and before you know it it never enters into our personal life there's a freedom I feel when I lift my hands here that I don't feel when I'm at home there's a confidence that I feel when I'm here that I don't feel at the house. There's a hunger that I have here that I don't have by myself. It never gets home. And there's a stumbling somewhere. And the issue always is I haven't properly prepared a place for I know when I come in here, glory is going to fall. Revelation will be released. And I haven't sufficiently prepared space in a place. To bring that home. So we try to bring home measures of blessing for our marriage. By the time we get home, we've been, we've been and stumbled. And the stuff that we felt for our marriage in now the corporate setting never gets into our, our personal life and our personal marriage. Simply because before we came, there had to be a place that we said we were going to prepare. So many times, listen to me, so many times we never bring home what we experience corporately. So many times. I'm going to say that again. So many times we never bring home what we experience corporately. Amen? Because we lack revelation concerning the posture for which we approach his presence. We come with many times with no expectation for personal repentance. I know we, we got to go down that road. We come and we don't think that we're going to change anything and yet get everything that fell here. So we'll try to take what we got here and use it as an add-on to our own, our old version of life and try to fit it in and figure out, man, I can't fit this freedom in how I do life. I can't fit this breakthrough in how I think. I can't fit this glory that I felt in how I talk. So we now try to talk the same, think the same, act the same, operate the same, but bring in the glory and find out by the time two or three weeks pass, what we felt when it fell isn't at our house anymore amen we wind up stumbling therefore never bringing home what's happening in the corporate house into our personal lives why because we did not prepare a place for the ark of God we not prepare a place glory be to God see one thing about the ark it won't it won't sit in a room with Dagon you can't put it in the room with idols. Amen. Sometimes what happens, we try to take it home and home gets tore up. Y'all know that, right? We'll try to bring the glory. As soon as I said yes to God, all hell broke loose in my life. As soon as I said yes to God, everything turned upside down. Folks start flipping on me. Why? Because you brought the true God in the midst of idol gods. And he started making them fall on their face. He start breaking idols. God, how can I fit you in my life? And God is saying, you can't. I am the truth, the way, and the life. 
I'm going to, if I'm staying, I'm breaking everything you call life that ain't related to me. Amen. I'm crushing it. I'm removing it because I'm a jealous God. Amen. And I want all or nothing. Amen. And so what we got to understand is God will literally many times won't allow to bring home from here to our home there simply because if we do, we ain't going to have no home there no more. That presence will tear it up. The level of lifestyle that it demands to take home what's released in this house, sometimes it's good that you ain't making home with that. Amen? Amen? It demands we prepare a place. Now watch this. I'm going to go a step further. First Chronicles chapter 16. So, so, and before I get into this, because I'm going to get into another, um, I'm going to get into another perspective and another um, requirement of bringing the ark of God, retrieving the presence, the mobile presence of God, where he's with us, where we go. We don't enter his presence. We take his presence with us. The first thing is we must prepare a place for it. We don't, we don't go after presence unless we first prepare a place. I'm, I'm coming into his presence already expecting to change something I'm, I got going on at home to make sure that whatever happens here, I can get back home. That's number one. We must prepare a place for the ark. Number one. Amen. First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse number four. And he appointed certain of the Levites... To minister before the ark of the Lord, right? And to record and to thank and to praise the Lord God of Israel, right? Now, if you look at 1 Chronicles 16 and 37 in the Amplified, would you put that up? 1 Chronicles 16, verse 37. I want to highlight this, and I'm going to highlight it out of the Amplified. Thank you, Lord. Look at what it says that David does for the sake of keeping the ark. So David left Asaph and his relatives there, where? Before the ark of the covenant of the Lord to minister before the ark, what? To minister before the ark continuously as each day's work required. David in order to properly house the ark in the place that he prepared for it, employed in shifts. And I said this earlier. He employed in shifts Levitical singers, Levitical praisers, Levitical musicians, and actually chroniclers and recorders who could record Amen. Because he expected that if you minister in the presence of God like that, God is going to speak. God is going to move. God, I need somebody recording what breaks out when men spend the entirety of their focus singing, worshiping, and praising before God. So, so literally like a full-time job that works around the clock, you got first shift, second shift, and third shift, singers, dancers, and musicians, and chroniclers coming before the ark and blessing God, coming before the ark and playing the guitar, coming before the ark and, 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 and working on the keyboard and, and, and just now being filled and blanketed by the glory that comes from now worshiping shipping before the presence of God they're doing this 24 hours a day seven days a week before the ark of God so why is that important that that means worship was always fresh and passionate why was worship always fresh and passionate and trying to give you a clue about now the the, the ark and and now how we now steward it it was fresh and passionate because in a, there was another shift coming in. And so when first shifts start getting tired of singing, another shift's come in and they can give a fresh song. 
They can give a fresh drum. They can give a fresh beat. So everything that is around the presence of God is always passionate, is always fervent, and it's always fresh because they're doing it in shit day long so so what we got to understand is is the recovery of the ark marked the inauguration of at all time worship the recovery of the ark marked the inauguration of at all time worship the place we must prepare if we're going to be a people that recover the ark the mobile presence of God we must pitch a tent in our hearts called at all times we're not I'm not talking about pitching that tent at our living room I'm not talking about pitching that tent in our kitchen I'm not talking about pitching that tent at our job that's a tent we pitch in our hearts that that which they were doing before the ark in shifts is what God has called us to pitch within our heart because the kingdom is to love the Lord thy God come on with all of our heart mind soul and strength God is saying if you're going to steward the ark the mobile presence of God God's present all presence always present on me and you the fixed in place presence of God he said, I need you to pitch a tent in your, your heart called at all times. I'll bless, bless me at all times. You'll sing to me at all times. You'll worship me at all times. There must be a place carved out in our hearts to worship him in shifts. I'm going to say that again. See, those different shifts of men represent different shifts of the heart. God said, I need a people that will worship me in shifts. And it be fresh, it be passionate, and it be now fervent. What, what am I talking about? If, if it shifts for the good, my worship is fresh, it is passionate. If it shifts for the bad, my worship is fresh and passionate. If I'm waiting on a shift that has not come yet, my worship is fresh and passionate and fervent for we know how to worship in shifts too because that's the tabernacle of David. What God is saying is just like they worshiped in shifts in the natural you can worship in shifts 24 hours a day out of your heart if me and you are willing to pitch a tent called at all times just as David watch this had Levites worshiping before the ark in shifts so we pitch a tent in our heart called at all times so no matter what the shift or the lack thereof worship is consistently fervent passionate and fresh what do we have for God right now? We have something fresh called thank you. There's a fresh thank you. It ain't a stale one. There's a fresh glory. It, it's not a stale one. Why? 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 Because we have said yes now to pitching a tent in our heart called at all times. All times. If we're not willing to pitch a tent in our hearts called at all times, we'll never recover the measure of his presence, he is designed to always be present on us. The recovery of the ark marked the inauguration of at all time worship. You know why? If he's always here, worship must always be expressed. You know why those Levites were to worship the entire time because the ark was the symbolization he's here and he ain't moving. If he's here and he, if he's going to now be here always, I need to always have a worship expression to express the God that's always here. The reality that he's an always hear God requires an always expressed worship. I'm going to say that again. The, the, the reality that he's an always hear God requires an expression of always expressed worship. 
The recovery of the ark is for sons and daughters who desire to adore him outside of the lines drawn by religious practices. No, no, I don't, I don't want to just worship him during praise and worship. That's lines drawn by religious practices. I don't just want to worship him during my 15 devotional in the morning, 15 minute devotional. That's lines drawn. I don't want to just post my scripture. I don't want to just do any of those things. All those are lines drawn it by religious practices, and also it demands now worship outside of the boundaries of an even more dangerous people, the, 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 the religiously reasonable folks. I'm going to say that again. It's worship outside of the boundaries set by the religiously reasonable folks. There is no reasonable way to worship God at all times. I'll say it this way. There is no reasonable way to worship a God who upholds the entire universe. Now watch this. He upholds the entire universe, the stars in course, the winds and the seasons, the waves and the waters. All by his word. And yet, watch this. Although he's running an entire universe, man, it's hard enough to run a company. A Fortune 500 company, it's hard enough to do that. He's running an entire universe, yet is completely committed to being with you and me on a personal level at all times. He's running a whole universe and saying, but I'm still completely committed to never leaving you and to interact. I'm, I want to be personally with you, within you, interacting with you at all times. Is that reasonable? If as unreasonable as it is to expect a God to be personally there at all times while he's running a universe, there's no way I can expect if I'm going to worship him that I'm going to worship him within reason. There must be an unreasonable worship for that measure of unreasonable commitment. There must be a measure of unreasonable worship for that measure of unreasonable commitment. The ark speaks of an invitation into an unreasonable worship walk. When God talks about recovering the ark, he's inviting us into an unreasonable worship walk. Unreasonable worship is worship that doesn't need a reason. Unreasonable worship is worship that doesn't need a reason. I'll say it again. Unreasonable worship is worship that doesn't necessitate a seen reason. It's when we clap without a seen reason. It is an unreasonable clap. It means I don't need a drum to clap. I don't need a church to clap. I don't need to see anything happening to clap. I'll just clap. They were sitting before the ark of God seeing no reason to clap, and they were clapping clapping because it was an unreasonable clap or now a clap that did not demand a reason to clap. It's when singing in adoration unto him without a seen reason. It's an unreasonable song. It's when I sing with no reason. Glory be to God. It's when I praise with no reason. It's when I say thank you with no seen reason. Let me put that on there. That's how we were. It's an unreasonable worship walk that now recovers covers the ark of God and see what happens so many times is is this is what David understood he understood watch this that if I am going to bring back the ark I must be willing to go outside of the boundaries of the religiously reasonable and I am going to bless God until I dance out of my clothes and there was and now his own wife glory be to God 
Naboth, his own wife to Saul is looking through a window at him while he's clapping for no reason, while he's spinning for no reason, while he's dancing for no reason, while he's glorifying God unreasonably. And the Bible says that she despised him in her heart. And the Bible says God's reaction to her despising him for giving him unreasonable worship was she was to never give birth again. God, in other words, worship is what makes your womb fruitful. There are some things that will never come out of our life without worship. There are some things we'll never produce. I want to see people saved. Well, you ain't going to produce no salvation without worship. I want to change the world. You ain't changing nothing without worship. It takes unreasonable worship. You know what Michael was looking out of when she now looked down at David and disdained his worship? She disdained the unreasonableness of his worship. You know what she was looking through a window. She, the Bible says she looked at him through the window and said, it don't take all that. She looked at him through the window and said, they, they just want to have church. They don't, he just want to talk about God all the time. He just, he, I don't see a reason for you to be doing all of that. Why? Because people will now use vision to disdain worship. Looking through a window speaks of vision. We look through windows for the sake of vision. The windows are there for vision. There are people who are so caught up in what they call vision that when we now begin to worship without reason, it's despised. When we begin to break alabaster boxes, you're wasting money. When we begin to extravagantly worship because we could be doing this and we could be doing that. But hold on one reason. Well, hold on for one minute. Glory be to God. Your place in the window doesn't give you a right. Glory be to God to now now uh, constrict worship because you have a vision. In actuality, you can't see without worship. Amen. In order to recover the ark, the transportable presence of God, his presence always being present upon us, we must say yes to an unreasonable worship walk. Worship that doesn't necessitate a reason. Clap your hands, all you people. Okay. What are we clapping for? It don't matter. Bless them. With a voice of triumph. What do we triumph over? It don't matter. Lift your hands. And give them. Why are we lifting our hands? It don't matter. Tell them thank you. What am I telling them thank you for? It don't. It's, it's worship without a reason. You will find the presence on people who worship without a reason. People who worship by reason are people who have valleys and mountains. Sometimes they're on the mountain, sometimes they're in the valley. Why? Because I need a reason. When I worship unreasonably, that means I worship without a seen reason, so nothing seen can interrupt my worship. I, I, know, I wasn't saying thank you for what he was doing, no way. I was saying thank you because he's good. I wasn't clapping my hands because he was doing something for me. I was clapping my hands because he's worthy. I wasn't singing because he finally brought me into my, my, my season. I was singing because when I sing, I feel the presence of God upon me. We have an inconsistency in worship because we worship by reason. When God finishes with us, we'll be able to worship with tears flowing down our face. When God, when God finishes with us, we'll be able to worship with doors slammed in our face. When God finishes with us, people won't be able to tell by our worship when he's given us something or we, we ain't got nothing at all. It's a blessing that our worship, when it enters a place where you can't tell if we got a million dollars, just got a million dollars or we broke. 
Because the same way we would worship broke, we worship with a million dollars. Because the million dollars, I'm an unreasonable worshiper, so I don't worship by a reason. So whether I got it or don't, it don't interrupt the decibel. It don't interrupt the intensity. It does not interrupt the level. It does not interrupt the passion. Amen. God is saying, I need unreasonable worshipers because those are the worshipers that can recover the ark. Because if you, th if we worship by reason, I'm going to tell you right now, the devil always got a thousand of them. There's a thousand reasons not to worship. The baby crying, the children fussing. Glory be to God. The husband ain't right. The wife ain't right. I got a pain in my body. I'm crying over this person because they're going through. There's a bunch of reasons. But I'm unreasonable. My worship is unreasonable. My praise is unreasonable. My seeking is unreasonable. Hallelujah. Hope y'all hear what I'm saying because that's the only way we recover the presence upon us. We can't walk with the presence if we now worship by reason because a king will never be present and not worship. Never. Go to the throne room of heaven and you'll find out that, that what they're doing 24 hours a day is worshiping God. They're never quiet around there. You can't be in his presence and quiet. What's their reason? Holy. Holy. Holy is the Lord of hosts. The earth is full of his glory. What's the reason tomorrow? Holy. Holy. Holy is a. What's the reason when I die and my children are 40 years old? What are they going to be? Holy. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is full of his glory. Unreasonable worship. We won't recover presence without unreasonable worship. Hallelujah. When we're going through, I'm not saying we might not need help. We might need not need a word, but we got unreasonable worship. And you'll find when you have unreasonable worship, stuff that you needed other people to say to you, you'll, you'll wind up getting a touch from God. Amen? Because our worship is uninterrupted. So when nothing seen can interrupt our worship, we've entered into a depth of worship. Watch this. Referred to in the Bible as worship in spirit. It's no longer carnal. When we are unreasonable worshipers, that category of worship, if we look at it from a biblical term, is worship in spirit. John 4 and 23, but the hour cometh. And now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father where? In spirit. Can spirit be seen? No. In spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to do what? Why does he seek the one who worships in spirit to worship him? Because he knows the one who worships in spirit won't stop worshiping him. He can trust him with the valley and knows worship will still be going forth. He can trust him in closed doors and know worship is going to be going forth. He can trust him when people betray him and know worship is going to go forth. I'm seeking that type of worshiper that worships me in spirit. So ultimately now, and we're talking about recovering the presence of God, unreasonable worship is the key that unlocks worship in the spirit. Unreasonable worship is the key that unlocks worship in the spirit. Those who worship God unreasonably will access spirit. What is spirit? Spirit is the realm of unreasonable resource. Unreasonable worship accesses unreasonable resource. Spirit realm is the limitless realm. Glory be to God. I'm trying to help you understand something. Spirit is the realm of unreasonable resource because it is the realm that 
that is according to his riches. He said, I will supply your need according to my riches. It is the realm of unreasonable resource because he doesn't give us according to our need. He gives us according to his riches. We might need 10, but all he has is a billion dollar bill. <laughs> it's, see, our problem is we think God wants to meet our needs, and he does, but according to his riches. He has a different currency. We only, we only print ones. We print fives. We print hundreds. What's the biggest bill they got? They got $1,000 bills. Amen? God prints bills that don't come in our currency. He never comes to meet our needs according to the measure of our needs, but according to his riches. Un if we get, if we get, if, if we need $50 and we get $50, God didn't supply our need, not according to his riches. Our problem is we think meeting the need is giving us exactly how much we need, but it's not. And the reason why we end up only getting what we need instead of according to his riches is because we don't have unreasonable worship. In that time of need, all we did was cry about our need. And we did not get un we did not enter into unreasonable worship, which would have gave us access to unreasonable resource, which would have gave us access to according to his riches when it comes to my need. When I want to give you something, I don't look at your need, I look at my riches. So you're asking me to heal your body, and I'm going to heal your bloodline. No, no, I'm not only going to take the cancer out of you. Cancer won't be permitted to go through any of your children because I never do it according to your need. I do it according to my riches. If you understand unreasonable worship so you can tap into unreasonable resource where they don't need chemotherapy because I will crush the lump before it can grow. Unreasonable worship does that. Amen? I'm meeting my needs. I'm paying my bills. Well, you ain't got according to his riches yet. Your, our worship is too reasonable. It's too reasonable. God is bringing us into unreasonable resource. Pastor, how can you say that? Because I'm being, I'm, I know if unreasonable resource is pouring on my life. I'm getting revelations I can't preach. This is unreasonable. There's stuff that, that God is speaking to me that I don't, I can't even preach. This is unreasonable anointing. I'm getting accolades I'm not looking for. Unreasonable. Unreasonable. Unreasonable resources tapped into by unreasonable Worship. Amen. We access unreasonable anointing. Come on. We access unreasonable gifting. We access unreasonable power. We access unreasonable stamina. We access unreasonable into how do you keep going? Uh, we access unreasonable stamina. And the, the greatest character is the one we're talking about, David. Did, did you know he had unreasonable power? How did he get that unreasonable power? How in the world can you kill a lion and a bear with your bare hands? He was a boy killing lions and bears with his bare hands. Well, I suggest to you the power came from worship. He was an unreasonable reasonable worshiper when what nobody looking I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be he was an unreasonable worshiper and so when now the giant comes he doesn't see the giant all he sees is how how this small giant is defying my big God because I've been so unreasonably worshiping God that I'm gonna step out on the field without no armor because I know my 
God, as I enter into unreasonable worship, will give me unreasonable authority, and I'm going to take the head of this giant, glory be to God, without laying my hands on. How in the world do you defeat a giant without laying your hands on that giant? And all it took was one. Do you know how they slang? He did not have a gun. He did not have an arrow. He did not have any of that. All he had was a slingshot, and this giant now is feet uh, all the way on the other side of the field, and he's not sitting still. The Bible says as the giant is charging him, and he's charging the giant, he's slinging that and whips it, and one shot, lamb. That sounds unreasonable to me. That's unreasonable. Who does that? Unless you tapped into the realm of unreasonable resource. What happens when you throw the rock and God aims it in the air? See, we don't. Re- Is David's aim that good? Or God that unreasonably favorable of David to make sure when he slung the rock, he came down and put his wind on it and made it hit directly in between. The presence was on that boy. He was an unreasonable worshiper. Unreasonable worship accesses the realm of the spirit. The realm of the spirit is the realm of unreasonable resource. Where do you keep on getting peace from? Your peace is unreasonable. What happens when God, we start tapping in an unreasonable peace? There's no way you should be holding it together right now. Right? There's no way you should have joy right now. That's unreasonable. You got too many. Re- that's, uh, that's unreasonable. See, we're thinking of unreasonable resource just in building houses and land. But what happens when it's in love, joy, and peace? Unreasonable. It don't make no sense how much peace you got. It don't make no sense how much joy. It's, that's unreasonable. I don't know how you got it, and I know you got good sense. But how do you stand like that? You know why? I'm an unreasonable worshiper. You know why? We're unreasonable worshipers. You know what you do at work? Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Bless your name. You know what you do in the morning? You lift your hands when they go like this. Oh, and you mess around and catch quickening. Amen. You know what you do while you ride in the car? You bless him. I'm here to tell you right now, that's unreasonable. The information age has been sent to steal away from us worship. You know why there's always a feed on your phone, more information? Because that information is a sign to attack our attention on our king. Amen? That's why there's always a feed. That's why there's always a new news. That's why there's always a new post. Because the enemy's assignment is to suffocate unreasonable worship. But God is bringing his people in this time. There's some folks that while they're riding, I'm cutting, I'm turning this thing down. I'm putting this thing up. And I'm going to go in because God, God is bringing us into the realm of unreasonable worship because he is trying to bring us to the place where we can retrieve the ark of Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Watch this. First Chronicles 15 and 26. And I'm closing. We're, we are being invited into a worship that can't be interrupted. Things are going to come, but it won't interrupt your worship. Tears are going to come, but it won't interrupt your worship. Attacks will happen, but it won't interrupt your worship. And when you worship at unreasonable times, you pull out unreasonable strength. When you worship at unreasonable times, you pull out unreasonable focus. When you worship at unreasonable times, you don't even know where it came from. I don't even know how I'm made. I don't even know how I'm standing. I don't even know why I'm not weak. Amen. Because the enemy is trying to keep us 
from what he knows gives us access to the realm of spirit. Unreasonable worship. So he spent time using religion to make us think we have to have a reason to praise God. Outside of the fact that he's God. He's Yahweh. He's my creator. Amen. We can worship him because we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And you don't know. I, f- I don't feel like I'm fearfully made, wonderfully made. Cut yourself. And watch yourself heal. Without nobody helping. Watch your skin stop the bleeding to save your life. And question the engineering of your king. First Chronicles 15 and 26. And it came to pass. This is when they're retrieving the ark. When God helped the Levites. That they bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord. That they, that they offered seven bullocks and seven rams. I want to go back to that first part. And it came to pass when God helped the Levites. That bear the ark of the covenant. So many times, and I'm closing, we attempt to get more of God without his help. The Bible says God helped the Levites bring his presence back. He helped them carry him. Amen. So many times we try to get more of God without his help. We give ourselves requirements, we give ourselves lists, we give ourselves laws, we give ourselves rules, and then we wind up failing to bring what what it is that we're going to retrieve because we're trying to do it without his help. And God helped the Levites. He didn't help Uzzah. And God helped the Levites. Amen? He didn't help David the first time. And God helped the Levites. Amen? Amen? You're about to go back into prayer, but you're going to pray with help. You're about to say yes to praise, but you're going to give praise with help. You're about to walk in peace, but you're going to walk in peace with help. God will help you do these things. This ain't stuff we do out of our own inward generated strength. This is something we do because we say in our minds at all times. I'm pitching a tent in my heart. At all times. 24 hours a day at every shift. At every shift. I'll bless the Lord. You know, we can bless him in our hearts without even opening our mouths. Is there times you've ever said, thank you, Lord, and you weren't moving your mouth? You might, some of you might be doing it right now. Glory be to God. That's your, that's your tent. Now, now, now learn, learn how to properly set up that tent and keep it in place. Hallelujah. Keep it there. Come on. Pitch the tent. Pitch the tent of David. Pitch the tabernacle. The place, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The blessing of God. You can't have it unless you first believe it. God, is that possible? Yes. It is. Will it make me different? Yes. It will. See, our problem is we're trying to bring that measure of presence into our current personality expression, and it will not work. Will that make you different? Yes. Do you want it? Make room for it. You are my peculiar people. If you're not peculiar, if we're not peculiar, we're not his people. There has to be something peculiar about us. You know what that word peculiar actually means? It actually means exclusive. It actually means committed to one thing. It doesn't mean strange. In the Greek, it's the word peripoesis, right? It actually means just committed to one thing. And that's what makes us strange. Because there are so few people that are only really just committed to one thing. The reason why people look at me and think I'm strange is because I'm actually just committed to one thing. The reason why some people look at you and think you're strange is because most people have multiple things they're committed to. And as long as you have multiple things, you're common. You're just a normal person. 
Amen. But when we get to the one thing desire, you'll find that you're going to look around and say, man, I don't sound like everybody else. You'll start being around people and they'll begin to give their perspective about what's happening. And you begin to understand, man, I don't see it like that. They'll begin to tell you what they got out of a scripture and you'll begin to say, man, that ain't what that really says. Without you trying to be different. Different is just being exclusive. When we're exclusively his, trust me, you ain't got to try to be different than nobody. You ain't got to put on the Jesus t-shirt to stand out. You will. Now the key is, are, are me and you willing to make room for that? Do we want to take that home? You, you can't put it in the lifestyle we're in. That, that we got to make room for that. We got to pitch a tent. Everybody stand on your feet. We close it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Look, I thank y'all um, for being in position. I don't think we're going to, unless the Lord leads me.